My name is Biaz. I'm South African, uh, but of Italian descent. That's why you'll see the surname. I'm a, a partner at IQ Business, which is a management consulting company. We do quite a lot of process engineering, uh, software development, you know, the whole stack of people, processing technology. And uh, I look after a team that's evolved over the last seven years, grown over seven years, um, around agile consulting, coaching, and training. Um, we've got a team of about 23 people. We're the largest in South Africa, so that's quite cool. Um, and we do quite nice stuff, primarily in financial services, primarily in banks, uh, which, are, which are some of the challenges that we have. Um, and I guess I'm going to be sharing some of my knowledge and experience. Now, it would be kind of boring, because we did this report, um, and it actually was launched on the 21st of August of, of this year at the Agile Africa Conference, which is the biggest conference in South Africa. And um, we launched this report with the results. And I've got some copies here for, for there's only like 20 copies. That's all I could bring in the suitcase, what they allow me, so because it's kind of heavy. Um, so I've got some of those to hand out. Um, and the reason, so I guess the question is why the Agile Index and why we wanted to do this. The first thing is to actually understand local context. Okay, so we needed, like, we had the version one report, so over the last seven years, I've, I've been involved in Agile, uh, the industry, and I've been following the version one report. And every year it comes out as a great report, but it's very heavily focused on, on data and stats from the US and Europe. I think in, in Africa, only 2% of the respondents respond out of the whole, the whole survey, and I think there were 10% in Asia in the last one. So that was kind of the context, and there's a lot of big, big slant around version one uh, product, people that own the product, right, their clients. So I want to get a local con context and local perspective. So obviously I need to understand the local context. I, I'd made this joke before about, the only, we're not, not the only thing about South Africa is AB de Villiers and cricket, right? We have more than that. We also do agile stuff there. <laughs> Anyways, so, so local context. And also in the last seven years, we built some knowledge base around our experience with these financial services organization. So how do we validate those things that we think about? So the first challenge that we find is business engagement. Mostly agile adoption is driven by the CIO or the CTO, driven by IT. Um, business is business and they don't get involved. So we have str struggles with product ownership, struggles with portfolio prioritization and things like that. So how do, how do we validate this through this research paper that we've done? The second one is around program execution. So I think you can all agree with me that, that Scrum at a team level, at one team, works really, really well. As soon as you scale it up to many teams, and what about other areas like mar uh, marketing, compliance, legal, what about them? So how do we actually execute across the program? Because that that's one of the biggest challenges that we're finding, right? The other one is around team delivery. Not as big a challenge as I mentioned already, but this is about the role specifically. Creating cross-functional, self-organized, all these nice words that people don't always understand. And that was also something we need to understand. Then we had what we call local optimization, global sub-optimization. What this means is, again, is driven by IT, but what about the rest of the business units? What about HR? What about procurement? What about release management? Because these guys want to go faster, right? They, they, that's why they buy Agile, but release management only releases every three months. That's not very Agile, right? So, so we talk about the entire system and the whole flow of work, you know, from concept to cash. So that's a challenge that we found. And the last one is really around change management and the lack of change management. Now, what we talk about is the people change element of it, right? Because as much as Scrum is a great process, it impacts people. And when it starts impacting people, there's a fear element, there's a resilience, there's a resistance, that kind of stuff happens. And change management, in, in my experience, has been really, really bad in organizations, especially these large organizations. They send an email to everybody and say, by the 1st of July, you will be agile. And we'll send you on training, and that's it. Okay? People don't know what their roles are. They don't know what they have to do. So this is about validating those, those things. So how do we do it? Okay? So I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment. Can I ask you all to stand up, please? I'm going to ask you some, a question, right? So we did, a, we did a, a research report. So it was a quantitative data. It took us about three months to run. And uh, we came up with certain results. Um, so I want to ask you, I'm going to make a statement. When, if this statement is true, okay, I want you to stay standing. Okay, if it's not true, you can sit. Okay, so do you work in IT primarily? No, first of all, first question, sorry. Um, are you primarily based in Bangalore? So you, do you work or do you live in Bangalore? If you don't live in Bangalore, you can sit. Okay. 
if you primarily work in IT, no, you can, if you stay, sit, stay seated, don't get up again. You had your chance, okay? <laughs> primarily work in IT, right? How many, how many of you actually are, are working financial services? It's quite a big difference, actually. Okay. So, and how many of you work, the, the people that are staying behind work in organizations that are 5,000 and plus? So large organizations, okay. So it's kind of interesting, and are the rest of you scrum masters and product owners and coaches that are standing? I'm just look at, looking. Okay. So I did this experiment in, in uh, Johannesburg at Agile Africa, and they're pretty much aligned to the data that we had. Um, so primarily in information technology, primarily financial services in the banks, being driven really, really hard in the banks, right? Um, larger organizations, you can see from the respondents, and a lot of leadership roles that responded. And then also, the, if you think about the roles, scrum masters, coaches, consultants, the, the agile specific roles. So this is one of the things, but it wasn't, for me the data is, is, is okay. What was more important was the qualitative side of things. So what I did was I interviewed seven industry leaders, um, some agile experts, you might not know them, and to the Kutsia, um, for Jess Plain Agile. She actually works with Lisa Atkins. Uh, if you know Lisa Atkins, the coach of Agile Coaches, and she trains coaching Agile teams in South Africa. Um, Ellen Gottestina is actually from the States. She, she writes the book Discover to Deliver, a very, very good book about Agile requirements analysis. She was in South Africa on our, as, a, as a guest of ours. And then um, Sam Lang and, and Karen Greaves. Some of you may know them. They do a lot of international conferences and talks, all right? And then we also spoke to some very senior executives in the banking space, financial services, our clients, and asked about their opinion. All these guys are actually responsible for driving agile adoption in the organization. So what we had to do is validate the data that we had with the qualitative interviews. And I promise you the interviews were so, uh, were so rich with information and data because the stories are quite true and authentic and, and you can actually learn quite a lot from it. Um, so if you want to learn about stuff, I think interview people have conversations because that's quite cool. So what are the key observations? So the first thing we have to understand is what is the maturity of Agile within South Africa, all right? Because a lot of people are saying, oh, we're two to three years behind the rest of the world, okay? Remember, we are relatively small compared to you guys. There's 56 million people in South Africa, okay? We have 1.3 billion. It's quite a big difference, okay? Um, so, so we need to understand how, how are we from the rest of the world in Africa. And what we found was that in, for larger organizations, can you see they've been obviously adopting this for much less time. So five years plus, only 17%. And as you go down, as they're smaller, they've been adopting it for much longer. Okay? And that's pretty simple because smaller organizations, in the nature in which they do, they are agile. Like startups are agile. They don't even call what they do agile, what, the, what they do agile. They just, that's the way they behave and they operate. Okay? What we also interestingly found was that the respondents, 50% of them had more than five years experience. Now what this is telling me in, this, in our industry is that agilists and agile experts are quite, are quite well sought after. People are looking for those skills, all right? I'm looking for scrum masters all the time, coaches all the time, so are our customers, okay? So they're hiring these people because they've got more experience in the organization in which they're working in and understand that kind of thing. So the question was, well, how are we, because number of years doesn't necessarily equal to maturity, okay? Um, so what we've actually figured out is we've probably crossed the chasm. In other words, if you see, if you hear about Jeffrey Moore, writes a book about crossing the chasm, good book, he talks about the adoption rate. And in South Africa, we're probably where we are in the early majority or the late majority, which means that most of the, the guys that are innovative and creative, they've taken on this journey already, and all the bigger organizations are now adopting this. What we have found, however, is that the other business units are lagging behind. Okay, they are the laggards. They lag behind. They wait for IT to do this and prove that it's successful before they will adopt it. But it's starting to change. The conversations are starting to happen in our in industry. I don't know if it's the same with you guys, but in marketing, as an example, is a very big industry where they're starting to use Scrum to run marketing projects and initiatives, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's where we are. Here's a, another thing, lack of technical practices or lack of focus on technical practices. I'm not sure if that's re as relevant here. I actually was pretty impressed that you got an XP conference, okay? 
which is quite cool because what we ask is which is the most popular framework that people use? What would it be? Scrum, right? Same as version one. Which is the least popular? XP. 0.4% use XP and feature-driven development. That's quite a big swing, right? If you think about where Scrum comes from, from software engineering, okay, what happened to all the engineering practices? Because when you actually ask the question about the specific practices, like stand-ups and continuous integration and those practices there, 59% and above were all process-driven practices, like stand-ups, like sprint planning, like refinements. So all the people were doing the process-heavy stuff, but very little were actually doing the engineering side of things. I think I like test-driven development was one of, very low down. Uh, refactoring, very low down. Continuous integration, very low down. Now that's obviously a concern for me, right? And the, the, the reason why people adopted Agile isn't necessary to improve the engineering discipline. Okay? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So what do we need to do, right? So it would be kind of boring if I just told you stats. So I'm going to come up with a little bit of tips around what you can think about doing. Um, and you, maybe you can apply some of the things. The first thing is really around the engineering practices and improvement that you need to focus on. The things that come out of retrospectives. You need to put them on the same backlog as you would do your features and your user stories. Oftentimes this is not done. Okay? Why do I say this? Is because it takes capacity away from the team. Can you appreciate that? In order for you to invest in something like CI, continuous integration, it's going to take time away from the team. Okay? Now you've got a challenge because the business and the product owners don't necessarily want you to focus on that. You agree or not? I don't know. What do they want? They want features. They want more, requir more user requirements, more user stories done, right? And what we do is we, we, we neglect these things. So what lands up happening? Technical debt. Okay? We take shortcuts on engineering practices, and what happens? We become slower. Okay? So we need to make sure that we prioritize those engineering practices on the same, they are first class citizens. Architecture items, engineering practices are the same priority as user features. Okay? Here's the other thing. I work as a coach in these organizations and, you, and they, none of them have slack time. Which what slack time means is available time in order to invest in learning and development and improvement activities. Because we're so busy coding and, and making sure that we meet our commitment we forget about our improvements. We go into organizations and we say, listen, we need to spend some time from a coach with a team. And you walk in and the team looks at you guys like, please go away. We are too busy right now. Does, that ever, does anybody ever experience that as a coach? We are too busy right now, please go away. So when I, what we've started to do now with our coaching engagements is actually contract with our clients that they will be, the team will be allowed slack time. Even if it's half a day a week. It's better than zero. So that's a good practice to have, right? To, to actually contract in slack time. And also, our scrum masters in our in industry, I don't know about yours, but I, I said I recruit a lot, I hire a lot. And when I interview them, I would say a good 80% come from a project management or a business analysis background. Not many of them come from a, from a technical background. Now, I'm not saying that the scrum masters need to actually know about coding and engineering and be able to code, but good domain knowledge is quite important because how are you going to be helping your team improve productivity if you don't understand that language? Okay? How do you get trust from the team? Now you're going to protect the team to say that I understand your language, you need to invest in things like CI to make it go faster a little bit later, improve your velocity, right? So those are things that we need to understand. And, that, and, and uh, we need to educate um, and actually also provide some technical coaching. I see that as a trend now in, in South Africa. There's a lot of engineering coaching that is happening. I don't know if that is happening in, in India as well. But people working with engineers, helping them improve their practices. Okay. Kind of scary, right? Yeah. Are we really faster? Are we faster really? Okay. So um, my position as partner, I'm quite fortunate. Or for, maybe not fortunate, actually. I don't know if that's fortunate. I get to spend a lot of time with CIOs and CEOs. Okay. Like I said, I don't know if that's a good thing. Okay, but if you ask them the number one reason why they want Agile, to go faster, right? To go faster. What I say to them is actually it's not going to make you faster. In fact, it's going to slow you down when you first start doing this. Are you still willing to do this journey? And there's a silence, okay? Because that's a hard conversation to have, right? 
And in fact, that's what happens. We've asked the question around the very same question as a version one. The reason why people adopt, the ability to be faster. They want to be faster. That's why people buy it, okay? And the ability to adapt to change, which actually what agile means, the word agile means the ability to adapt to change, is 58%. However, when you overlap that and overlay that with the actual benefits that teams realized and the individuals realized, the ability to, to adapt to change was very high. So people saw that as their biggest benefit. I think Padma was next door was saying the same thing, right? Um, and what was actually kind of frightening was realizing the improvement time to market was, was third lowest out of 10. So people acknowledged that it didn't necessarily make them faster. Because if you think about it, if you have to wait for every three months to do release management, that's as fast as you're going to be. You're not going to be faster than that. You're not going to introduce products and markets to services faster than three months if that's what your governance process allows you. Okay? So what do we need to do? So even, even the, the experts were saying, if you think that Agile is going to be a silver uh, a bullet to help you speed up, be, be prepared. So our conversations is to set expectations up front. Um, what I would recommend is that, you, I don't know if you, any of you have seen the Virginia Satir change model. Uh, it talks about when anything changes in an environment, there's a natural drop in productivity that will happen. And you need to create these kind of events. Um, one of the gentlemen yesterday was saying these powerful statements around how do we get out of that, that dip of productivity. Because eventually you will get faster, okay? But how do we get faster, right? The, fir the first thing is we need to invest in automation. We need some slack time for that. We need to remove the organizational constraints, which is not necessarily the team's responsibility or accountability, but the leader's accountability. In one of the previous talks, we were talking about uh, agile leadership. And we said, what does agile leadership mean? About enablement but enabling the team to get faster. So if you remove these things away from the team, hopefully they will get faster, okay? We then, is it cheaper? Now this is a very controversial one. I might ask you to switch off the video for, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so I, I'm allowed to say this because I'm not in front of the, our clients right at the moment, but one of our clients, okay, actually it's happening as more and more of a trend. What people are starting to do in South Africa um, a consulting company, which will not, not mention, they're going to the organization and say, we will save you costs by implementing Agile. What does that mean? That what they're going to do is they're going to create cross-functional teams, okay? They're going to remove a management layer, and they're going to restructure the business, okay? What do you think happens when that, when that happens? Disaster, right? Because what happens when you restructure? Your best people leave. Number one, because they fear their jobs, right? Then you're left over with these people that don't understand what they have to play, what role they have to play. I'll give you a scary story. Um, there was a guy, a gentleman, project manager for 20 years, okay? Now, skilled project manager. Now, in the new way of working, what they're calling it, they don't need a project manager anymore. So he had to reapply for his position. He was basically, and they said, they're not gonna cut costs at that point in time. After six months, he was doing nothing. He was sitting doing idle. Eventually, I said to him, you have to now reskill yourself as to be an engineer. Now, if you ask me, I don't know, that that's pretty scary, right? For me, that's, that's scary. So cost is actually not a, ben a necessary benefit from what we see, okay? However, however, what we do see is that if you are prioritizing your portfolio correctly, okay, in other words, the portfolio management, and prioritizing the projects that give you the highest value, okay, you will, you will cut costs. You will be able to save some costs. Why? Because it means that you're do, not doing projects that are not valuable. Okay? That's where you will save costs. It will improve the flow of work. You'll eliminate, you'll eliminate waste in the system. That's where you will save costs. You will remove bureaucracy and governance. However, if using that as an opportunity to, to, from, a, from a restructuring perspective, People are going to resist it, and you're going to have lots and lots of problems. Okay, I, I, a story. I, I went into a client, a new client, and I walked into the room, and we talk about agile. And one of the guys says, "I don't trust you anymore." So I'm like, "What do you mean?" Because now I was at the previous place, and I joined here because they weren't doing agile. 
Now you're walking in this room and now you're going to do agile, right? So, so think about that, okay? So we've got to understand that. So optimize the flow of work, remove waste, remove organization impediments to improve the flow and the delivery, right? And focus on the high value items. That's how you will save costs. So some of the successes and challenges, um, I'm going to talk about some of these specifically from stories. Uh, what we found though is that, and it's pretty simple, I think it's self-explanatory, um, at a team level, Scrum and Agile more successful, right? So only 4% said it was not at all successful, okay? As soon as you scale up to the organization, what will happen? More challenges. That's obvious. I don't think we need data to prove that. And we say that 21% of, of organizations will struggle with this, or people that responded said their organization was not successful, okay? So I want to actually leave it a, a little bit of a, I've got some uh, videos. This is Antoinette Kutsia, just explaining some of her thoughts. Now, um, if you really want to get the full benefit of Agile, you actually need to change your entire organization. You know, and, and I mean, that's not what people expect when they ask for this. You need to change the way um, that you manage, first of all. You know, so, so leadership um, is, has the biggest impact and, has, and is responsible for the biggest change. People don't expect this. And I don't think that we pay enough attention to leaders when we think about this and when we do this. Okay, so um, in the agile community, very often there's a disdain for management. Um, you know, like as if managers are not individuals. You know, like uh, as in individuals and interactions as well. So, in terms of change, you know, we, we actually have to put a change facilitation. In terms of change facilitation of this whole process. Um, People completely underestimate the effort that needs to go into that, the human effort that needs to go into that, because this is a change that will touch every part of your organization. It will change the way that you manage your organization or that you lead your organization, preferably. You know, that's also that's a change in itself. Um, and it will also change how you how you view work and how you view people who do the work. And that's not a you know, that's not a six month or a year. Now that's more like a five-year change because it fundamentally changes the way that we look at work and the way that we look at the people doing the work. So um, I think this whole, the whole thing about challenges, if I had to summarize it, it, it really is about the people element of it, okay? Um, the process is, and if you read the Scrum Guide, 16 pages, it says, this process is simple to understand, difficult to implement, right? Why? Because it involves people. Okay, it involves people, right? And this whole thing about challenges is really around change management and the lack of change management. And that's the kind of focus I want to talk about now. The first one is really around a lack of buy-in, okay? So, so most of agile adoptions, and I call them adoptions, by the way, not transformations, because transformation signifies an end, and I believe that agile is going to continue all the time, right? It's, it's continuous, is driven by top management. So top management are the ones that are saying, for executives, you need to go, or saying to the teams, you need to go agile. I won't necessarily change my behavior, but you as a team need to be agile, okay? I still need game charts, I still need uh, reports, I still need all those steer codes, but you guys be agile, right? And from the bottom up, from the teams, it's only 8%, and there's a combination in between, okay? So around people that are driving agile adoption, right? Now, for me, it's not about buy-in, okay? Because buy-in means that you have to sell something for people to buy into it. I like the word enroll. So I'd rather have people enroll into the change because they would want to do it. They want to be part of this new way of working. And that's quite different, okay? Because typically, mandated change fails. If you follow Daniel Mezik, anybody know who Daniel Mezik is? Okay, he talks about open, using open space technology to run agile adoptions and transformation which basically means participatory and collaborative change. Get everybody involved in the change, run many experiments, okay, to be able to do this. Not from driven from a top down. So I always say that change management has to be from top down, bottom up, and in the middle. And I'll talk about the middle layer just now. So this is At a strategic moment. level, one of the biggest challenges to the successful adoption of Agile is that technology teams often lead the change. It would be far more desirable for the transformation to be owned and driven by business executives, ideally the CEO, given that this requires a culture and mindset change at organizational level. 
So I might disagree a little bit with Norman. Norman is the head of agile adoption uh, for Standard Bank, uh, one of the, the largest banks in South Africa. And um, he talks about executive and he talks about the CEO, right? So what's happening with one of my clients, the CEO is actually having daily Kanban sessions with these portfolios. Every day he's sitting with the portfolios and they've got a visual board. Now that's pretty good, right? Because that show buying, right? They enrolled into that change. And that's quite cool. So we need to think about how do we change the hearts and minds of individuals? How do we change the hearts and minds of individuals to be able to enroll in the change? People are only going to be doing this change if they see a benefit for themselves. We're selfish that way, unfortunately. Okay? If this doesn't suit me, I might resist it. If I'm going to be challenging this, I'm going to resist it. Okay? So how do we change this to benefit them? And that's the conversation that we need to have, right? Because using, using a, a lean change approach where we do lots of experimentation, anybody familiar with lean change? Okay? I've, I, I can tell you some horrible stories. I have an, a client that used a waterfall method to plan and execute an agile adoption. 18 months for them to come up with a plan, okay? And they said, we're going to define the agile process. And after six months, they showed me the process. It was scrum, but with the process flows. It was crazy stuff, but anyway. So we need to actually understand how do we create experiments and feedback-driven approach to change management that is not a waterfall-driven, not driven from top down. How do we get everybody involved? Lean coffees, brown bag sessions, sharing sessions, those are all good things to have, right? Now this was quite an aha moment for me, okay? So we've, uh, we've acknowledged change management activities, not done properly. Not, not done properly, okay? We've, we know that, okay? But this is really about resilience. And unfortunately, the quote is quite long, but if you get the book, and you can access the, uh, by the way, you can LinkedIn me or whatever, and I'll give you access on the website. You can download the report as well, the PDF version. This, um, this quote was from uh, an executive at uh, Standard Bank, um, at one of the banks. It was one of the, the aha moments for me. What these banks are doing, they've got the financial acumen, they've got the money, they've got the budget to do this kind of stuff. So they hire and recruit people from Google, Facebook, all these tech companies to come into the organization. What ends up happening is after 12 months, these guys get frustrated because it takes so long to do the change. Okay? So they leave, and then it starts again. Okay? And then it starts from scratch, and then it picks up again until somebody else does. So when I talk about resilience in change, it means that we, we've got to be, as coaches, as scrum masters, need to understand that this is a journey. We are challenged every day to make this thing work. What we need to understand and appreciate, this is not going to be an overnight thing. You need to take some time. Okay? And that's where resilience comes in. One of my mentors, uh, a gentleman named Jeff Hackett from Chef, Chef the Tool product set, does DevOps coaching engineering. He said to me, one thing that I always remind that the, your, your customers and stakeholders, A, it takes time, and B, reflect on the small victories, no matter how small they are. Okay? The fact that your product owner is now involved in your sprint planning for the first time, that's great. The fact that you may be doing reviews, the fact that maybe you can automate and deploy and you've got continuous pipeline. An example that I want to talk about here was one of our clients, in order for them to provision hardware, it normally would take anything from six months to nine months to provision and install and have hardware so a production server ready. These guys invested in their DevOps practices. They, were many, they managed to, to actually provision using infrastructure as a code in nine minutes. Now, that for me, that's a massive victory. Start sharing that information with so many other people because they're going to be saying, it's not possible. You know, nine minutes is not possible. Well, that team, they just did it. So don't tell me it's not possible. It is possible. Okay? And that changes the language of people, right? And changes the way people behave. So reflect on and celebrate those victories. This is also a controversial one. The role of the product owner and the scrum master. Now, I did this thing around, uh, did this, uh, a bit of a thing around um, how many certified scrum masters in India versus how many certified scrum product owners in India. Ten times more. 
certified scrum masters than product owners. In South Africa, it's a little bit less. It's three times more. Um, and we asked the question, what is the hardest role to fulfill? Product owner. Okay. Why? Because in these businesses, the best product owner that have the mandate to make the decisions are typically in the business and they're operationally focused and they don't have the time to spend with a team. So how do we solve that as teams? We do the proxy product owner thing, which by the way is an anti-pattern. We'll have a technical product owner, also an anti-pattern. Okay? What you want is the person that's best positioned to play that role, which understands the domain, is credible, has got the time to spend with the, t with the people, right? And that's very, very hard to get right. It's the hardest thing to get right for us. To be honest, I think if we solve this in South Africa, our agile adoption and maturity will actually exponentially improve. Because once we get buy-in from the product ownership, we unlock the value from a customer and from the business, right? Because they are the representatives from the business and the customer. We get closer to the customer. That's what we want to do. So what we started to do, I'm not going to play the video. What we started to do uh, from our coaching perspective is we used to coach teams primarily, okay? What we found is after that in coaching engagement, it might be six months or three months or whatever, the team will typically regress back to their old behaviors. And the reason why is because they see the coach as the expert. The team reflects to the coach as the expert. Even though they might have a scrum master in the team, they see that coach as an expert, okay? So what we started doing is now coaching only the product owners and the scrum masters. So we coach the teams through them. We empower them to be the best coaches, the product owners and scrum masters that they can be. Because by empowering them to play that role effectively, it becomes more sustainable. So you create these change agents. Because actually they're, they're going to be driving the change in the organization, right? Once you've gone as a coach, as an external consultant, they've got to stay behind. So empower them to be the best that they can be. Important, right? And these other things. Again, provide slack. We do role clarification workshops when we lift off teams. Because people don't understand what the role of a product owner is. So we do that when we first start off to actually understand and explain that to them. And we let them self-select, actually, based on what our requirements are from a product owner, who the best person is. Then you'll get enrollment again. Okay? This one is very interesting, and it's... Um, and I, I sort of got that a little bit yesterday around how title is very important in, in India, okay? To an extent in South Africa, the same. What people do, okay, is in organizations that promote, to get promoted, because you've got KPAs and KPIs and you've got levels, in order for you to get higher pay or bigger bonuses, you typically have to be a manager, right? That's what normally happens, okay? That's what we've seen. So what ends up happening is you're really, really strong technical people or your best people, right? So what do we do? We promote them to manager. It's called the Peter Principle. We promote people beyond the level of competence. What I found often is that those management people might not be really, really good with people. Because if they've got an engineering background, they might struggle, or they might not even want to be managers. Okay? What Standard Bank have done is they've provided a career path for experts. They've now created an opportunity for managers to go back into being a technical expert. For people that are, that are engineers at heart, for them to go back to what they love, their passion, which is, which is mastery, right? That's what they've done. That's pretty cool, okay? So we need to be able to work with our HR to define this career path for experts, provide an opportunity for them. Because truly, from a management perspective, I mean, Agile, I mean, you talk about less, large-scale Scrum, which is part of uh, Scrum Alliance now, right? Part of the, what Scrum Alliance advocates. They, they actually pretty much pretty hard on management. They say get rid of management. That's what they're saying, if you speak to Craig Larman and Baz Vaud. Okay, so think about that. It's quite a hectic, right? So how do we create an opportunity for, for management and, and them to play that role? I'm not going to spend too much time around this one because I wanna, I've only got a few minutes left. Um, but the important thing is whenever we're taking practices, and I am spending time, you see, I lied. Um, so, so organizations, like they look at frameworks like Scaled Agile Framework or LESS, and they, they see a silver bullet answer, right? 
without understanding what the principles are. And then they start making trade-off conversations, like we're not going to do the, the, the retrospective, because it's not that important. So, so without understanding the principles, how do you actually make that trade-off conversation? So whenever we go into organizations, we don't start with Scrum or Kanban or any of those frameworks. We start with the principles. When you coach teams, we don't make sure that they're having a daily stand-up or they've got beautiful boards with post-it notes. We make sure that they're understanding those values and those principles. That's a starting point for everything that we do. Even SAFE, as critical as people are about it, and I'm as well, all right, has got some really good principles. The same as less. They're actually more or less the same principles. Decentralized decision making, making economic decisions, cadence and synchronization, the same principles. So if you start with those principles, it's much easier to tailor those frameworks, okay? So what does the Agile future look like? A short video. I think in I was bringing the principles that we apply in our own um, transitions and you know, the top three of those using safe to fail experiments mm -hmm. uh, is something we still have to educate um, clients on. This is not a big bang thing. Secondly, focus on value delivery, so really help organizations understand what value is and adjust the organization to, to streamline that. Um, so that's, I think, business agility. And the third one, decentralizing control. So creating containers for empowering people further down the organization. That's Peter Unamak. He's known as the godfather of Scrum in South Africa because he, he was the first CST in South Africa. Um, so having a good conversation with him. So what started to happen is that Scrum and Agile is actually moving what we call upstream, it's closer to the customer. That's why things like UX, design thinking, uh, all those kind of leaning UX, that's what's happening because we need to get closer to the customer using an iterative and incremental approach. So that in the business side. What's also happening with the DevOps movement is to get closer to downstream. So how do we operationalize, how do we create that kind of environment and culture? So it's becoming more like that. It's going to be the new ways of working, right? I, I always say to people, um, and maybe I'll touch on it on the next slide, is that I will retire when people stop calling it agile, and it just becomes the way we do things, okay? Because nobody walks around here and says, I'm a waterfall project manager. <laughs> Am I right? So why do we go and call ourselves agile coaches and agile scrum masters and things like that? Just saying. Maybe we should think about it differently. I'm actually starting to use the word agile a lot less in my conversations with executives. Just around the principles, that's what's important. So a lot of conversations been about business agility, right? What does it mean? So moving into marketing, moving into uh, uh, HR, moving into other areas, okay? Like government, maybe far out there. Okay, what about education? So if you follow things like Edu Scrum, in the Netherlands, they use Scrum to educate uh, uh, students. Same as the video yesterday morning, by the way. That's fantastic, right? So we need to get to this approach around business agility, okay? And I want to end off with the story. Can I have got time for a story? Three minutes, okay? So that's a cheetah. You know what a cheetah is? Fastest animal, land animal, right? That's an impala, which is an antelope, okay? So the story goes, a boy and his father are walking in the bush. And as they're walking, they stumble across a cheetah stalking an impala. And the son says to the dad, 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 look what's happening. I bet you that the cheetah will eat that impala. And this, the father says to the son, I bet you will get away. Anything, they will get away. He goes, no, 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 let's see. After a few frantic seconds, lots of dust, etc., the impala does get away. So the son says to the father, why did you, why, how did you know that? How is that possible? He goes, well, think about this, son. Think about the cheetah's motivation is to get the next piece of food, right? What is the impala's motivated by? Life, okay? So when I, I have a conversation with organizations, these large organizations are now being disrupted by small organizations. You need to be able to change, right? You need to be able to change. There's an urgency to survive and adapt in this new way of thinking. The impala is also agile. The biggest difference between the cheetah and the impala Never mind the speed, okay, is the, re the resilience. The cheetah, after a certain amount of time, actually runs out of steam and energy. 
The Impala doesn't. So we need to be like the Impala more than the Cheetah. Okay. So we have the same challenges. I've, I've, I've been observing two days. By the way, wonderful culture, wonderful people, really, really friendly, really appreciate the time that I've had you. But I've observed you have guys got the same challenges as what we have. Even though you're in a different continent, same problems, same challenges, same as the U.S., nothing is different. What I do urge, uh, urge you guys is not to be so hard on yourselves. Even though you are challenged and you say it's not a perfect scrum or whatever, think about where you were three years ago. Are you in a better place today than you were three years ago? If the answer is yes, keep going. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.